Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We're not closing the doors because there's another panel on the other side and we just allowed people to freely walk back and forth. So we have a competition for the most interesting panel this afternoon. Very self, self-confidently we can say we surely are. And um, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. This is we, We're having protocol now here because Ambassador Ramzi Ezzedin, the Egyptian ambassador to Berlin, Your Excellency, is here today. So a very warm well, 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 welcome to all of you. But he's not the most important guest because the most important guest is sitting left of me. And he is a, a, a brand new discovery, so brand new that he has not even been translated into German so far. If there are any publishers or literature agents uh, covering up here somewhere, sitting in the audience, this is your moment to take notes and uh, grab a business card of Mr. Ezenin Shokri Fischer. Uh, Ezenin Shokri Fischer is not, as some of you might suggest, of German or French origin, because his last name Fischer may suggest. When we had our, you know, this this is a, it's, it's, a, it's a topic for small talk, right? So, oh, where's your name from, Fischer? Well, uh, rumor has it that his family always lived on the shores of the Suez Canal since it, would, for, since it was built. And uh, Fischer is a very common name in Egypt, too. And uh, apparent, apparently... In that area. In that area of Egypt. But, but apparently his uh, ancestors really were fishermen. Yeah, we decided you should probably have a narrative ready for these moments. Whenever, you know, the, the presenters don't know what to ask, they ask you about your last name. Okay, but um, he didn't become a fisherman. He became a diplomat in the foreign service of uh, the Arab Republic of Egypt. And as many great novelists from the Arab world and from Egypt, there is there was an, a, a previous profession, a previous activity which might have inspired him in the search for his characters and for the settings of his very international novels. And, um, well, you could argue that you, you had to do this in order to become a good novel writer because a good novel writer needs to have a pre-education before becoming a novel writer. That's what probably novel writers and politicians have in common. The first book that was, no, let's say it wasn't published. It was published, but it was not publicized, was uh, your novel, The Killing of Fahreddin in 1995. So here's a very strange situation because usually you would say that a novel writer wants to have his book published and he wants it to be known that it's his book and he wants the book to be successful. But here's a problem since uh, Ezzedin Shukri Fischer had a lot of knowledge about what was going on in Egypt and he had a profession, he could not. Uh, divulge this information in novels and say, "Hey, I'm a I'm a diplomat, and, but I'm also a novel writer." So this was kind of secret knowledge. It was it was uh, you know it circulated in in uh, in, in uh, uh, among friends and among an interested readership, but he didn't want it to be publicized that this was his book. Um, he then wrote a tetralogy, a quartet of novels, and uh, among these are uh, The Pharaonic Journey, The Killing of Fakhreddin, as I just mentioned, another title is Abu Omar al-Masri, and the first book which was officially announced as uh, you know, him being the author was The Intensive Care Ward, which was published in 2008, when the Mubarak, Mubarak government was still firmly in power. And... Um, in the last couple of years, while he was collecting information, character, and inspiration for his works, um, he was also involved in very, very uh, hot topics in international politics. Because after his uh, PhD in uh, political science, in which he wrote about globalization and global government, he uh, was hired, as I said, by the by the Egyptian Foreign Service, and he served in Darfur in an observatory mission in the Sudan as well as a member of the fact-finding, uh, UN fact-finding committee into, into the uh, Rafiq Hariri investigation in 2005, which was, as most of you may know, um, the case of the still, you know, uh, un- uninvesti- mainly uninvestigated murder of the former Lebanese Prime Minister Rafiq, uh, Rafiq Hariri. So what we will have here today is we will present his latest work, Embrace on Brooklyn Bridge, which is not translated into uh, into German and is not tr- translated into English yet. So exclusively for this event, uh, Shukri Fischer has um, prepared an, uh, a short, trans- a brief translation, 
which will uh, what Christian Römer will read for us in English uh, in a few minutes. And it is the first novel which is actually set not in the Middle East but in the West. You have dealt with international context before, with global context before, of course. But um, here we have the story of, let's say, a story of initiation of a young immigrant in the United States. So this is a topic which, you know, the, the image of the West is something which is rather uh, quite frequently repercussed in, in, in our, our, our literature. And it's also part of the discourse about mutual cliches. How do we see the Middle East and how do, do Middle Eastern people see the West? So it very well fits into uh, into this event against fatigue. And uh, I would like to invite you now before we get into a conversation about what you write, uh, to read to us a few lines in the beautiful Arab, uh, Arabic language from your latest book. Thank you. Thank you very much. You kind of touched on a number of issues that um, I think all deserve um, a response, but uh, we'll, we'll postpone this to after the... Step by step. And... Um, To the audience, um, don't worry, we're, we're not about to read the entire novels to you. Um, what I will do is <clears throat> I'll read the first paragraph of the, um, the second chapter, and then uh, Christian will, um, will, will, will read a um, few paragraphs of the same chapter, including those two paragraphs in, in English. Al-Lugu ila Mark. عندما لمح رامي المحصل يفتح باب العربة عدل ياقط قميصه بسرعة فهو دائم القلق من أن تكون فانلته الداخلية ظاهرة شد ياقة الجاكيت ليتأكد من تغطيتها تماما مر المحصل دون أن ينظر إليه فهو جالس هنا منذ ساعتين توقف المحصل عند الركبة الشابة التي صعدت للقطار في آخر توقف وفحص تذكرتها ثم مضى عائدا نحو عربة المقصف القطار ممتلئ بالراكبين بالركاب الذاهبين لنيويورك في عطلة نهاية الأسبوع هذا هو وقت الذروة في أسعار السفر كلفته التذكرة 122 دولارا كاملة لو كان قد أجل سفره لصباح الغد لوفر 40 دولارا لكنه كان سيفوت عشاء الدكتور درويش وهذه أول مرة يدعوه لمنزله منذ سنوات اشترى التذكرة الأغلى ثم فاته القطار حين نمك الغبي في محطة واشنطن وفاته القطار لا يصدق أنه فعل ذلك لكن بعد 22 ساعة جلوس في القطار القادم من ميامي كان متعبا ولا يدري كيف نام على رخام محطة الاتحاد في واشنطن لكنه نام وعندما استيقظ أدرك أن قطاره قد رحل ومعه موعد العشاء وكل الترتيبات التي أجراها وقبل أن ينهار تماما أسرع وأخذ القطار الأخير الذاهب لنيويورك لا يعلم ما سيفعله هناك بالضبط لكنه سيفكر في الطريق. Thank you. Christian Ruba. When Rami saw the conductor open the carriage door, he quickly straightened his shirt collar. He was always afraid his undershirt was showing and tucked his jacket collar over to make completely sure it wasn't. The conductor passed by without looking at him, even though he'd been sitting there for two hours. However, he did stop by the young girl sitting next to him checking her ticket and then heading back to the dining car. The train was full of people going to New York for the weekend. It was peak time and he'd paid a whole $122. If he'd left it till the next morning, it would have been $40. But that evening, he was going to have dinner with Professor Darwish, his first invite from him in years. He had bought the more expensive ticket, but, like an idiot, ended up missing the train because he had fallen asleep in Washington. He couldn't believe he had done it, but after spending 22 hours on the train from Miami, he'd been exhausted. 
He had no idea how he could have slept on Union Station's marble floor either, but he had. He woke to realize his train had gone, and with it, his dinner appointment, and all the other arrangements he had made. He was on the point of giving up on it all, but instead made a dash for the last train to New York. He didn't exactly know what he would do when he got there, but he would work it out on the way. It would take about another hour and a half to reach New York, and the girl in his carriage was obviously going there too. She seemed to be about his daughter Sasha's age. She had put her headphones on as soon as she had sat down, but kept the music low. She had leaned over and asked him if the noise bothered him, and he told her it didn't. A nice girl. Well, it seemed that way at least, but who knew really? She might have stolen money from her parents. He ran his hand over the $14 in his pocket and smiled sardonically to himself. He bore no grudge anymore. Whatever had happened, had happened, and things were how they were. He wasn't bitter towards his boss, his wife, his daughters, any of them. They had all behaved as their natures dictated. So what was the use of being bitter about it? It still made him gloomy, though. He hadn't foreseen all this upheaval. He was annoyed with himself and reflected that if he had brought up his daughters better, if he had been less easygoing and careless when raising them, they might have treated him better. He had thought about it a lot over the last few months, but every time he came to the same conclusion. The time for that was long gone. He wondered what Selma was like now. Was she like his daughters, or had her Egyptian education made her different? He hadn't seen her since she was ten, and girls quickly changed at that age, incredibly quickly. He looked at his watch, and then his ticket. He would be in New York around midnight. He'd go straight to Darvish's house, and then Mark would pick him up after dinner and take him to stay with him in Brooklyn. Once he'd settled down at Mark's, he could think all these things through properly. He had graduated from the Department of Middle Eastern Studies at NYU and had gone on to work on a three-year research project with Professor Darwish. Darwish had liked him, not just because he was a distant relation, Rami's aunt was married to his cousin, but because he was kind-hearted and straight with everyone. Rami was hard-working too, a key quality in a researcher, and Darwish foresaw a promising future if he stayed in academia. But then the chance of a high-flying job in a top public relations and marketing firm changed Rami's mind. The monthly pay outstripped what the university would offer him a year, even with a professorship. So he took it. His decision hadn't exactly pleased Darwish. He was shocked that Rami would even think about it and live it that he had turned down the chance he had given him. He liked and respected Rami, but felt that he had bestowed a generous honor indeed in letting Rami work alongside him, only for him to be bought off with a handful of dollar bills. How cheap. He was resentful that Rami could walk away like that. Once a year, Rami would get in touch to find out how he was, but always got the same curt response. Darwish would never ask after him, but Rami was persistent, and so Darwish would invite him over whenever he was in New York. It was there that Rami met Selma, the professor's granddaughter. Selma was a sweet kid who tried to trust those she didn't know and not be afraid of strangers. Whenever Rami visited his old teacher in summer, he would normally find Selma around spending the holidays with her mother in the city. Sometimes 
he would bring Sasha with him and they would all go off to the movies together or a picnic maybe. But all that was done with now. These last few years, he rarely went to New York and when he did, Professor Darvish no longer invited him round. Their contact was reduced to birthdays, with Rami initiating and Darwish replying tersely. That was why Rami was so taken aback to receive this dinner invitation, and, of course, he had eagerly accepted, though it cost him the last dollar in his pocket to get there. Ever since he had moved to Miami, he had lived a life of solid equanimity. He had met his wife, Maria, born in Cuba, but from a Lebanese family, who taught Spanish in the private school near his wife. They had worked hard to get their two daughters into Stanford, and Sasha, the eldest, had even managed to win a scholarship which covered the tuition in full. The one thing that nagged the way at Rami was his sense of isolation. He could never reveal what he felt to anyone, And when he did try to convey this sense of isolation to Maria, it ended in a quarrel. He turned to Sasha, older and smarter than his younger daughter Marta, and tried to explain what he meant, but words failed him. He, a translator, couldn't find the words in English to express exactly what he meant. This made him even gloomier, And he was overcome by the distinct sense that this was just what isolation was. Trying to speak to your own daughter in a language not your own. Knowing you would never be understood in your own tongue. He fell silent and moved to another subject. Sasha, however, was going through that phase when young girls try to act the adult and listen in on their parents' grown-up conversations. She wanted to break out of being a typical teenager, only talking about herself and ignoring everyone else. So she pursued it with him, and under persistent prompting, he began to talk. He started by telling her that his loneliness arose from his having had to rely entirely on himself in life. She retorted that this was how it was for everyone in America. He heard what she said, all right, but this wasn't the only world he knew. There was another world, one he could still remember, a world of family and friends who help you when times are tough. You know they are always there, and they stand by you always, whenever you need them, emotionally, materially, whatever. He told her many stories about his family in Egypt, whom he had visited as a child on holiday. He talked about the relatives, friends, and neighbors with whom he had built real relationships and to whom he would return every year, finding everything as together and reassuring as ever, as if he had left only the day before. Sasha replied, that people always exaggerate the allure of their past lives, and he shook his head in sorrowful refutation. He told her that he had not made real friends in America, somewhere he'd lived most of his life, not in the way he had made them in Egypt, where he had only gone once a year when school was out. Some might attribute it to everybody's lack of free time, but the truth was that that was the way of life itself in America, full stop. That was the problem. He asked her if she could just drop in on her friends without phoning or scheduling beforehand and explained how absurd that would seem in Egypt. There, a friend was someone who knew they could drop in you anytime. Rami had not planned on telling his daughter all this and did not even know for sure if it was what he really felt. But when she asked questions, he replied, and the confidence and warmth he sensed in their dialogue 
allowed him to open up and let it all out. As Rami was telling his clever daughter all this, he had no idea it would set off a chain of reactions that would lead to the utter destruction of his way of life. Rami's downfall was not, in fact, a sudden plummet, but a gradual slide through a sequence of events which could easily have been avoided. In fact, some of these events seemed disconnected and random at the time, but that is how these things work sometimes. Not all our choices follow inevitably on from what comes before. Sometimes we face a fork in the road and choose to veer one way and not the other. And that, in turn, places a new dilemma before us, and so it goes on. A year later, we find ourselves in a place we'd never dreamt of coming to. Sometimes we can reverse our path, but most times we cannot do this, so we just carry on. Other times we fix on one path, knowing what a heavy sacrifice it will demand of us. Friends may try to turn us back, but we already know the price we have chosen to pay. It is not a price we had to pay, not a matter of fate, but it is one we paid to remain true to ourselves, whether it ends in triumph, destruction, or who knows what. Then, 20 years later, we look back and can't remember what sent us down that road in the first place. The chain of events which led to Rami's ruin was just like that. A series of choices which he had spent little time debating when they arose, each leading on to another and then, eventually, the wreck of the life he had built for himself over 30 years. He had unburdened his inner soul secret to his clever daughter, Sasha, had confessed to the loneliness which had beset him ever since he had landed in America. And that confession had two consequences. The first was that Sasha, his older and smarter daughter, was totally thrown by her father's words, though they confirmed what she had long suspected in her heart. Her father didn't really love them at all, but had ended up sharing his life with them, had just gone along with it all. She, her sister, and her mother were on one side, and her father, mute and with nothing to say, was on the other. It confirmed what she had long supposed, but never dared to admit to herself. He was not like them. He was some other species. They were normal and natural and engaged in the life they found around them, but he was an awkward, alien presence. From their first school days until now, whenever they invited friends over, their beautiful, powerful mother was admittedly a bit brash too, but she always welcomed her classmates into their home, showering them with attention and questions and food and was well-liked by their families. Her sister was crazy, but no more than others of her age. He was the strange element in their world, the Arab immigrant who had never adapted. She had no time for the mentality of immigrants, who left their country to begin a new life in another place, and then spent the whole time complaining that they were homesick. Her father had always stood in the way of the normal life she wanted. He was a dead weight. Now it seemed he wanted to drive them all even further apart. She did not articulate any of this in her head as such, but it stalled around her heart. She asked him the obvious question. Where are you going with all this? Where do you want this to take us. Thank you very, thank you very much, Christian. 
Well, the, 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 the chapter was well chosen because I think it tells a lot about the character and the past that we are trying to investigate as somebody who has not read the book. It is probably difficult to sum it up, and I think it's a very di very difficult and very dangerous trap of interpretation to try to sum up a book somebody else has written because we are already starting to interpret. So, uh, Shukri, your hero is not doesn't seem to be a hero like many other heroes. He's not he's not robbing a bank. He's not raising an army against an empire. He's a Middle Eastern studies PhD student who failed to meet the expe expectations of his professor. This doesn't sound spectacular in the first place. And this person apparently falls into a, you call it a downfall or, or a ruin. Um, could you pro probably sum up what went wrong in his life that we're having all this mess now? Um, the novel has no hero. That's the, uh, the thing about it. It's uh, eight chapters. Each chapter is told by one of the eight characters. Sometimes the chapters are told by a narrator, but who's also um, staying very close to, to the character. And each of the characters could claim to be a hero in the novel. And there are so many ways of reading it, as you said, and the minute you go into the interpretation, um, you'll find that there has been a number of interpretations for this novel. And I don't want to add my interpretation to the text I wrote. I think it's a bit too much for a writer to do. But um, you can... Some readers saw the first the character, um, their wish, the professor of um, Arab history, as the main character. Others saw the, his, do, his granddaughter, who's turning 21, and in, in whose honor he is organizing a dinner party and inviting all the other characters. This is the unifying element of the novel. So all of the eight are on their way to, uh, to this birthday party. So some readers saw the, the girl herself as um, the main character. You can read it as all eight together constitute um, a story, and each one of them has a story. Some of the stories, of course, overlap. So sometimes you read, so you read about Rami. Yeah, you read from the point of view of Rami. And then you will read from the others, some of them knew Rami, so you get a different perspective on his own story. So in fact, what I'm doing here is trying to abdicate my responsibility as a narrator and pass it to the reader. So you... Do you socialize with, with Rami or one of the other characters? Do you kind of... I know this is a difficult question. Is there something autobiographic, uh, autobiographical in your in, in in your novel? Let's not go that far. But you certainly yeah, you, you certainly not you're not Selma, and you're not the old professor of Arab history, right? Um, there is no there is no autobiographical element in the novel, and this question keeps coming back. And I think it's probably. Um, a normal reaction from readers who would like to know if they identify someone, especially if they met the, 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 the writer or know the writer. But I, 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 I truly, and without any false modesty, I truly think that the writer is completely insignificant. And it is, his life doesn't mean anything to um, the novel or the reader. And I, you know, if you read, not that I'm comparing, but if you read Chekhov or Tolstoy, without knowing anything about their lives, I don't know if this changes your, your, your reading or makes it worse um, at all. I think the contrary. So even if there were a biographical um, element, it doesn't matter anymore, I guess. This is what I'm trying to say. Having said this, the last uh, this is the first novel outside the, the quartet. So I have four novels and then this one, which comes in, in a completely different environment. The first four had um, as characters um, a terrorist. So it was kind of a, 
a true terrorist in Afghanistan, all that, and um, an editor-in-chief, a woman um, leader in the Muslim Brothers, a Coptic human rights professor, and, and, um, and a former um, intelligence officer. And I've been um, accused of uh, being all five. So I've been a woman in the Muslim Brothers as well. And in fact, um, it, it is not, I'm not saying this just for the anecdote, it's it's very rewarding when someone tells you this because you know that this means that you get somehow you touch the way this character in real life is and this is what conveys the so this is my long answer to your question marvelous answer but the question here is you're touching a very fashionable well at least in germany and europe a very fashionable subject at the moment which is the story of a failed integration These are very heavy words, and many people in Germany would say, and certainly also in the U.S., let's stay away from this. We haven't, we've had enough of you know, failed integration stories, integration as a subject in literature in general. Um, why is this subject still uh, relevant, and do you think, are you accusing the failure of, of integration Are you stereotyping the character as a person that has, always, that has never been integrated and as a victim of this failed integration? When I wrote this, I had in mind the question how to get a free ticket to Germany, so I wrote about this fashion thing. But uh, other than the ticket, um, it's actually a challenge to write about certain themes because so much has has been written about them and this is one of them in Arabic literature so not just a debate in Europe currently and uh, there have been waves of the way the East and West have been depicted so the minute you decide to move your characters into this place the um, obvious question is you know why do we need another novel about this but this novel can be read not as a novel about the lives of immigrants and their integration or lack of. It can be read not about not as a novel about East and Western relations between them. It can be read about identity and identity in the broader sense, not identity of the immigrants, but the human identity, how people develop their identity, how this identity changed, does it change, is it... Um, do you make, is identity made up? Is this some kind of an imagined narrative that people adhere to? Or is identity something that kind of solid and sticks to you and you can get rid of? You can also read it as, um, as a novel about alienation, human alienation, not, you know, so the characters could be non-Egyptians and all this could happen in Cairo or in Western Sahara or anywhere where you have an event that brings them together. And those are questions. Every, everyone in the eight characters is asking himself questions, is questioning himself and his life and what brought him here and so on. And these readings have been done, you know, in reviews and people who wrote about them made all these readings and in a way it's very good to me because it it's good for the sales because you know if you like this you know i was in in, in abu dhabi um, about a month ago and i met in in a book club with um, mainly composed of immigrants and almost all of them saw it as a novel about immigration and the life of immigrants elsewhere in in abu dhabi not in the west so I think that this is what I said earlier is because I abdicated the narration. I don't tell the reader, this is the story. There is only one way of looking at it. And this is the interpretation of the feelings and decisions of the characters. And this is how you should think. I think that's a bit too much for the writer to do. And um, kind of demodé, it is, uh, I think, with... It's part of individuals seeking freedom is that the reader wants to have some freedom and not be told what to read and how to interpret it. So because I abandoned this, I think all those readings are legitimate. So you can read it about um, as a novel about integration. And then, and this is not a way to you know duck the question, you have various types of immigrants in this novel. You have... Rami, who's been um, correct um, all his life. He says in another part of the chapter, 
you know, he paid all his taxes. He was never late for the tax declaration. He never um, started, um, um, never did a barbecue except in the, you know, legitimate places. He never uh, took out his garbage outside the hours. He was just really being observant of the rules of the host uh, society so that to avoid the exact same thing that happened to him, that he finds himself in a train with $14 in his pocket and no one to go to. And then he, he lives in this narrative of an, you know, an old Egypt he lived in where life was great and the friends were really friends and the relatives were welcoming and so on. But this is, history. This is, this is his presentation of his plight. Is this really the story? And then you meet or you hear about Mark, the one he's actually giving him shelter. It's Mark. It's not an Ibrahim who's giving him shelter. And then his brother who's kind of discouraging him from going back to Egypt because after so many years it's going to be difficult for him to go back. So there are other ways of looking. Is it his, is it his definition of, his, of himself and the past and the future and how he lives? Is it his own doing, in a way, this failed integration? And he is well integrated. Then you have other characters, including this um, famous or infamous um, person who visits the 9-11 memorial and who actually contributed to the attacks. And he's sitting in the memorial, looking at the pictures and watching the visitors and reacting to it with a completely different narrative about what brought him to Brooklyn. And so on. There are, you know, eight characters. Well, let's say that the, your literature is part of a very, um, of a very intellectual um, level of, uh, of, of, you know, novel writing. There are others, there are like page turners, like Ala Aswani, who's like now in, famous in, in, in Europe. I don't know if he's considered higher literature in Egypt, but um, in which way would you say your, your, your novel writing is at the moment perceived in Egypt? I mean, you mentioned before you have been accused because you've been writing about, about Uh, political issues, Islamism, terrorism, and we will have another panel tonight, another debate where we'll talk about this subject exclusively. But here you are touching something which, which might be not very important to the Egyptian people, apart from the fact that you are representing a West in your novel, or the, the several characters have, you know, present their version of the West, which might be dif more differentiated and more and, and different from the from the common knowledge about what the West is like in Egypt? I, I know I talk a lot, but it's, it's, but hard, it's hard for me to really talk about the novel, despite all that. So, um, and I'm making an effort. I, I think novels have to be entertaining and have to be page turners. You can't keep the pace in the entire novel, but if the reader loses the will to continue reading, then this is a failed novel, even if it has the most fantastic and deepest ideas and thoughts. Because it's not a book. It's not um, a series of articles. It's not a PhD dissertation. It's a novel. So it has to stay faithful to what it is. It's about people. It's about characters. It's about stories. You're telling a story. This is my kind of novel. This is the novel I like to read, and this is the novel I like and claim to write. Um, other people write about um, emotions. So, um, you know, you wake up in the morning, you look at the pen, and how you relate to the pen, and how does this affect you, and so on. I lose interest after five pages. That might be a fan, you know, it can get a Nobel Prize, but good for the writer. So... I think the first layer, my first test is this. If the, if the reader loses appetite, then something went wrong with it. But if, it, if this is the only layer, then it's an entertainment novel. It's not literature. So there has to be other layers. And I think the more layers you get, the better the novel. And again, Tolstoy, if you go back and read uh, War and Peace, um, you know, you read it normally when you're in high school or you pretend you've read it and then you read it again. And if you are interested in literature, you would inevitably go back and read it. And every time you read it, there's something else in it that you see that you didn't see the first time. That's a great novel. 
So between an entertaining novel, and it, uh, it is an entertaining novel as well. So between just an entertaining novel that you pick up in an airport and spend the flight on, and a great novel, I think you know this is where writers, in my view, should aim, is to go in this direction. But they have to keep this entertaining part. And without bragging, it's a bestseller. So I guess um, somebody is entertained. So you're not, um, last question, you're not, but by, 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 by setting up the story in a different world, which is, now, which is now the United States and no longer the Middle East, you're not eyeing for an international readership? I always hope secretly, not so secretly, that uh, not my novels get translated and read by other people. But when I write, I think I have in mind um, the Egyptian audience, mainly. But it doesn't mean anything, actually, because the Egyptian audience I have in mind could be extremely different from the Egyptian audience we have in the streets. And um, if you compare, you know, I'm, I'm what, I'm 45 now, and like everyone, you think you're young, until you're reminded you're not anymore. So um, I always wrote and thought this is what people in Cairo and in Egypt really think and read and so on, until I started to read um, new things written by the 20 years old. And some of them would say, you know, why do you use such a classic language? Just try to be a little bit cooler. So um, Every, I think every writer writes for an audience in his mind. It's imaginary audience. And it could, some of them, and this is probably one way also of reading it, some of those, Im, of this imaginary audience could be Egyptian or New Yorker or something else. And you don't think that if you look at the, the European or Western uh, book market, book industry, that um, certain authors make it because they are so Egyptian? Which means, like, they are so so much, you know, representing uh, a certain image, but also a, a certain political context and environment. You have this problem with German art. You know, if you look at German art, Neo Rauch, the, the Leipziger Schule, they are so they sell so well in the United States because they look so German, and because you can identify them with very simple ideas of, of, of German contemporary history. So do you think that there is, there is, let's say, a trademark which is like Egyptian or Middle Eastern literature which is now sparked through the offspring? I think there are stereotypes. I'm not sure about the German example, whether it actually you as a German would see the image recognized as German as identical to your recognition of what German is. But as far as Arabic literature is concerned, there are stereotypes and there are filters. When now we're not talking about individual readers, we're talking about the industry and the market. Publishers who want to make money um, frame and shape the way Arabic literature and the Arabic ident Arab identity is portrayed in Europe through their choice of what to be their selection of what to be translated or not. So what you call identified as very Egyptian, I would remove very Egyptian and I would put identified as identical or close to identical to our stereotypes of what Egyptians are. So if I depict Egyptians who look Western in this stereotype, you wouldn't probably be interested Because this, you, you're looking for the, you know, we moved from the Edward Said's old exotic oriental to, without offense to Alal Aswani, but to the characters Alal Aswani presents as the new Egyptian. And God knows, maybe in five years you will look for the young um, semi-homeless guy on Tahrir Square uh, shouting down with Mubarak as the um, um, real, very Egyptian. So these choices by the publishers, they do shape how Europe sees the rest of the world, in this part of the world um, <clears throat> at least. And unfortunately, I have to say this at the same time, on our part, we're doing next to nothing to change this. So what we do is people like me come here and complain about uh, European publishers, but there is no Arab publisher, private or public, who's trying to break those barriers and present and translate different kind of, of, of literature. Um, so, you know. Says a real Egyptian. Ladies and gentlemen, questions to the author? I can actually take one because 
time-wise, we have a very strict regime. It's, I think time-wise, the regime of Heinrich Böll Stiftung is stricter than the Mubarak regime. Time-wise, time-wise. Um, 6.20. Any questions, remarks, comments? Well, they all... Uh. <laughs> Don't be afraid. No, just, you know, let's make sure that this book gets translated into German as soon as possible. Uh, as I just mentioned, tonight we will have another, uh, we will talk on um, on even more Egyptian subjects, which is um, uh, the topic of, of uh, Islamism and terrorism in uh, literature and the mutual perception of Western and, uh, and uh, Middle Eastern uh, literature. Um, from now, we have a 15 minutes coffee and cigarette break, right? Or 10 minutes, rather. Okay, thank you, Christian. And uh, then we will continue with Ali Al Mukri from Yemen, who is this gentleman over there. He will talk to you in the uh, in, in, in this in this room, and uh, he will be hosted by Ahmed Hamas. And Stefan Kaminski is going to read uh, the German translation of his last work. And we have Borka Pavicevic. Um, who is translated by Bettina Gras. Yeah, I hope I didn't forget any announcements. And we thank you all for coming. <laughs>